Hey guys, welcome back to the studio here in Battleford, Saskatchewan. Happy New Year for 2019, all the best for you, and hopefully uh, 2018 had some good memories for you as well. I know when I look back, uh, 2018 definitely had a few highlights, and at the top of the list has to be uh, exploring the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge uh, with the International League of Conservation Photographers. That was definitely a trip that uh, opened my eyes and changed my life in terms of understanding the connection between having a passion for photography and connecting that with a purpose. It was definitely a, a great experience and looking forward to doing more work like that here in Saskatchewan too for 2019. Another thing I'm looking forward to for the new year is this uh, new interview series that my friend Dan over at Shutter Muse proposed to me a few weeks back. He said, you know, do you want to have some conversations with uh, photographers and a whole range of genres? And I said yes right away. That's definitely something I was up for. Uh, I've just gone through this move from Yukon to Saskatchewan and I was already planning on, you know, trying to find an interesting way of staying connected with my peers, colleagues and mentors that I have up in the Yukon and other folks that I'm in touch with around the world too. And definitely this, uh, the idea that Dan had was something that really just came at the right time and gives me a perfect excuse to reach out to folks and have conversations with them where I'm hoping to learn things about how they've started their business, how they're staying inspired and motivated with photography. And I'm really excited to share this first episode with you today. It's somebody that I've been looking up to for a long, long time, and that's uh, none other than Moose Peterson. Definitely an inspiration in the world of uh, wildlife and conservation photography, and perhaps even greater than the impact that he's had on the uh, the critters and the creatures out there has been his impact on other photographers. He's uh, just, um, somebody who's not afraid to share what he's learned and he's done that through workshops and a tremendous amount of resources on his website too so i was definitely uh honored and humbled that he would say yes when i reached out to him it was a little bit of a a stretch ask for our first interview for the series but no uh no better way to kick it off right than to have somebody like moose on tap for this first episode so Stay tuned, and if you listen right through to the end, you're going to hear some great things like uh, Moose's number one recommendation or his number one piece of advice for photographers, no matter what genre they're in. Don't have to be in wildlife photography to get something out of this conversation, that's for sure. Uh, but you also hear that one critter that's avoided Moose for a long time, and he calls the bastard. He's got a little story about someone that uh, just doesn't want to get their picture taken, and is definitely on Moose's bucket list for what he needs to shoot next. Also, you're going to hear how, you know, maybe Moose is famous for his wildlife photography, but he's also got some other passions too, and he's uh, working on a great documentary right now, it sure sounds like, and that's in the area of aviation history, and he's uh, going to tell you all about that one. He's got a documentary coming up and planning to be over in Europe in 2019 to do a little recreation around the D-Day, so you're going to hear all about that, and we're just you know, launching this series now. This is the first episode right out the door and I think you'll see in this first recording there were a few little hiccups that we had with the technology, some new things going on here in the studio. And uh, thanks for your patience. I appreciate you uh, being here and being willing to listen along the way and promise that we're going to tighten up some of those little hiccups we had and uh, really look forward to sharing more conversations with you with photographers in the new year. The list is... Uh, it's going to be a great year, I think, if we can get these done for you guys. So stay tuned. Let's roll this first interview with Moose, and we'll see you on the flip side. Three, two, one. We're firing in all cylinders now. We're actually recording. Excellent. I got, I got video. I got audio. This is just too good of a moment to pass up and have a little technical hiccup. So uh, Technology's thanks. Technology's for... working. Yay. <laughs> exactly. That's a win. <laughs> <laughs> so, Moose, you're back home for the holidays now, or...? I am. Uh, I typically am home normally for at least two to three months. It's an old pattern from when our boys were cross-country skiing. We were going to the races, and we try to to keep it going. It's more of a challenge this year with a documentary, but uh, yeah, I'm home for five weeks. So oh, wow. for me, that's that's a great stretch. Oh, that's awesome. So what's your big project? What's this documentary you're working on? Well, I've been an editorial photographer my entire career. Uh, telling story uh, stories and lots of photographs and words is kind of my mo. And we can uh, we found that you can reach more people and perhaps enlighten the world a bit more in a documentary format versus a article. Hmm. 
the difference is that uh, article, you get paid some money, documentary, you spend a lot of money. Uh, <laughs> so we're doing a documentary. we part of a group that rescued a World War II C-47 from the swamps in Florida, pulled it out, brought it back to Earth, uh, the Airworthy, and we are flying it the northern route over to England with uh, a couple dozen others. And then on June 6, 2019, we'll be flying over the beaches of D-Day. Oh, my God. Wow. And then we'll take the plane up to the Netherlands and then Germany and Italy, and then we'll be back home. So the documentary is about that whole process from rescuing the plane to bring it back to life. Uh, includes the many of the vets who are part of the C-47. And then it'll be, of course, the whole ceremony and tribute over there in France and Germany. And uh, it'll be it's, it's it's quite a big deal. Wow. Yeah. I'm not even a, a super huge buff on uh, my war history stuff, but I got goosebumps just thinking about that and how much that means uh, recreating that kind of journey there. Wow. Well, you can go to normandybound.com. That's our, uh, I guess you'd call it our teaser site. We have our teaser up there. Yeah. But it's um, it's a Moose Peterson and Son production. So uh, my principal, the principal videographer is my oldest son, Brent. And, yeah. Uh, we, we put in a lot of hours each month with the plane as we keep moving it forward. Oh, wow. Wow. Super cool. Yeah, and <sighs> it's, it's very cool, very rewarding, and, and it's one hell of a lot of fun. Oh, yeah, that's great. Well, um, yeah, so as I mentioned, too, this, the idea for this little chat, too, I'm going to launch a series in 2019 on a site that I contribute to called Shutter Muse. And yep. my thinking for this series, too, is it's kind of like seeing what your muse is and what inspires you and having a chance to talk with some great leaders in the world of photography and uh, to share your expertise and share that with the audience over at Shutter Muse. Well, I'm honored uh, to be part of it. Uh, you know, the all I've had nothing but self assignments, self assignments my entire career. I've never had someone call me up and say, hey. We need you to go and film this. We're going to pay X amount of dollars. It's been all self-driven. So yeah. that's, you know, a big part of what it is I do as a photographer. Wow, that's huge. That's cool. Um, yeah, so just to, just to resonate how much how important it is or how happy I am to be chatting with you, too. Back in uh, 2013, I had my first opportunity to hear you speak in Vancouver at the Professional, oh, okay. Pho Professional Photographers of Canada conference there. And you had a great, uh, a great presentation kind of about your, um, what, how you got into photography and how you tie your photography and not just uh, wildlife photography, but, you know, having a purpose to that and conservation photography. Um, so maybe mm -hmm. my, my first question for you in the, the scripted part of our chat, perhaps, too, is when did you first realize or could you tell us a little bit more about when you realized you could make a life and a living with your photography? I can make a living at this? <laughs> wow. Um, so fame and fortune was never what we were after. And I say we, my wife Sharon and I. Um, third generation Californian, I've just seen a lot of the things that I grew up with. Places I used to play, um, critics used to watch, just disappear. So it's really a very selfish thing that I think I'm doing and is trying to preserve all that I can for my kids and their kids and future generations. I mean, we were we were left an incredible legacy uh, of wild heritage and wild places to go. And I think at the very least, we need to leave that when we leave and the next generation comes as stewards of all this. So the idea of making money, hmm. which, you know, I'm an I'm a economic major and uh, I'm a U.S. Uh, capitalist through and through. You know, making money uh, definitely is uh, part of the the genre, but it's never been the driving force. We have always, um, you know, we start out. Uh, long story short, we end up having to put all our our business on credit cards the first few years because something that had we've been working towards fell through and I always keep my word. So we paid for it with credit cards. Yeah. Um, I remember the days shooting film where I shoot film and it's sitting in the freezer till I got afford to get it processed. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, it's, it's never been easy and I don't think it's supposed to be easy, 
Um, I never wrote, read in any book back in the day that, ah, be a live photographer, it's easy. So I never assumed it would be and never took it that it was hard was a problem. That's just part of the process. Yeah, yeah. And I guess where I was asking too, yeah, life and living, kind of trying to think about those those two halves too. Like you could have a, a life and not make a penny if it's your passion, right? And it sounds like that's what that's what's driving you is the, the purpose. Well, I've been very fortunate. I have a family that's very supportive and they have been with me the entire time. And when the kids were living at home, they're, they're now young men and much out there doing their own thing. Uh, you know, when I went out shooting on projects, we pulled them out of school. You hmm. know, there's many years they did not attend school as many days as the state required them. But because of, of uh, one, uh, their dad being their dad, making them make sure they did all their homework along with their mom, they also learned all this extra because of working with these biologists. Wow. And so they went through school with, you know, great grades and with learning experiences and that kept me, you know, being a dad and a father and still having a family and doing this thing I call photography. Wow. And it's, it's turned out really well because I, you know, my favorite shooting partners are both my sons it's to this day. Yeah, wow, look at that. And you're uh, yeah, producing this documentary with them too, and you're really a team there. That's pretty awesome. It is fun because normally you'd have, you know, you have storyboards, you have a script, you have shooting assignments. Um, you have to explain, if I'm, you know, if I'm the director, producer, then you have to kind of spell out, I want you there doing this and that. And with my boys, uh, they know, and we know each other well enough that we see what's being missed and without saying a word, it gets dealt with. Um, selection of music, that's really easy. They grew up listening to dad's stuff, so they know where that comes from. So there's, there is uh, always going to be some uh, creative ideas that we bounce around, which is, which is a great part, but it's a, it's a pretty smooth machine that makes it so much fun and so incredibly rewarding. Wow. And we get a boatload done. I mean, we get a boatload done. <laughs> yeah, I think there's no question about that. That's for sure. Um, I think for a lot of our uh, our listeners or our readers or whatever, too, they'd be curious. I think you were talking there before, too, about you're self-assigned. It seems for a lot of folks, you know, they want to, you know, knock on the door of the editors and get on their list and get on their call list and be the person they're calling for an assignment. But can you talk about how you get your ideas or how you're um, creating your content or your next project? How do you identify those? Well, it takes more than I could describe right here, but in a nutshell, uh, first I stay very informed. I read a lot. You know, I'm on book 26 for the year that I've read. Wow. Uh, so knowing your subject's really important, whatever genre, it doesn't make a difference. So once you know your subject, you kind of stay informed, you look what's, you know, what's happening. I, I'm a voracious uh, eater of, of visuals and of stories and headlines. And from that and re talking to people who I trust and, and uh, who respect, somehow things come in my mind of, of a direction I want to go. And then once that direction is in my mind, I'm kind of voracious. I don't really give up until I think I've got what I need now. Uh, real quickly in the editorial business, uh, which is a magazine for lack of better terms for most people. Yeah. You know, there's, if you take all those photographs out of a magazine, you have a, a scientific journal. Scientific journals uh, are pretty boring, right? <laughs> it's not what you're going to pick up and read Sunday morning with your coffee with the snow falling next to a fire. You have to have photographs. Editors have to have photographs, yeah. and they have to go out and find them. And in that process of finding them, if they have just one hole in an article, they works really hard to find that one picture for that one hole. But if you, the businessman, the photographer, writes the article and you create the holes with your own photographs and you deliver that whole package, hmm. not only do you increase your payday from just that one possible photograph, if you happen to find that hole, you now have created a service for that photo buyer so now you put on their hands a complete text photo package, and if it's quality, not only do they buy it, they continue to come to you, which is why I've been in 143 magazines worldwide. I continue to, um, and this year I'm way off my average, 
but I continue to deliver those text photo packages to my photo buyers. Um, and I have the extreme luxury at this point, after doing it for decades, I just deliver it. I don't, I don't even ask if they're interested because I know my clients well enough. I know what they're looking for. I put it in their hands. I know it's going to get published. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. So just make it, you're, you're making it an offer they can't refuse, basically, right? When you've got everything all tidied up and buttoned up. and Yeah, really, photo, the photography is everything. If you've got the photograph, everything else falls into place. So you have the photograph, you're in control. Most photographers don't understand that for a lot of reasons, and they rely on too many things other than solid craftsmanship behind the camera. And when you do that, you don't have the photograph photo buyers are still my best teachers. You know, they're the ones that sit there and and they look at the photographs and they tell me how they'd be stronger when it comes to telling a Tory. They don't say, hey, you know, you should have used this lens or that f stop. They don't go there. <laughs> they say, you know, this would have had more impact if, and they talk about the storytelling. Yeah. So they're still the ones who, you know, after 40 years are teaching me and I'm still learning stuff every day. I don't know everything, but they're still the best instructors. So Besides paying you, they're teaching you. I mean, why would you not want to be part of that? Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's great. Um, I, that just makes me think about, you know, for photographers starting out or people who are trying to get into the business too, quite often you'll, if you get that rejection letter or you get some harsh criticism on your photos, that can really take the wind out of your sails. But it, it sounds like you're talking about that. That's, uh, you know, a teachable moments or whatever. Or that's great stuff for you to grasp onto and learn from. I have a file drawer full of written rejection notices back in the days when we used typewriters and paper. Yeah. You know, um, I, I am kind of weird. I, I know I am weird. <laughs> not kind of, I am weird. And one thing that I have always uh, looked for is failure because um, that's how you grow. Hmm. The only way you can grow. So hmm. uh, rejection notices for stupid things like, you know, you part your hair wrong or, you, you know, you got gray hair or something. Personal things, yeah, that's just that's just unprofessional. But when they say this photograph, you could have done this better. Yeah, I take that to heart. I never take it as a criticism. That's how you grow. Yeah, yeah, they know what they're talking about. Yeah, their livelihood depends on it. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Um, let's see. Just thinking about inspiration now, too. Um, it, like it sounds like you've been doing so much work in the field and I, I really understand that the passion's coming from within there too but are you able to to point to somebody uh somebody else in the past or somebody maybe that wasn't a photographer that's really sparked um or been somebody that you've emulated or been inspired by well it comes uh to literature i read john muir my entire time growing up you know i spent a lot of a lot of my summer in the backcountry of my father going down the Sierra. Uh, John Muir is somebody who I read quite a bit. So that um, probably brought the romantic, poetic part of me out more than anything else. As far as, far as photography goes, there was a photographer way back when named Tupper Ansel Blake, hmm. who was a specialized California photographer, who was also a very romantic photographer trying to save pieces of California through his photography, who... I, probably gave me the ideas that uh, started me down the road that I, I did go on. Hmm. But otherwise, um, you know, life is kind of the, the greatest inspiration. Uh, I, I look at light 24-7, 365. When it grabs my attention, I always try to figure out why and, and what's going on there. And then is that something I can learn from, incorporated in my photographs, um, conversations I have with all the researchers, biologists, the uh, airplane, uh, airplane pilots, the World War II vets, all of them, all that goes in my head and pushes me in different directions at times. So there's not any one source. There's lots of sources that are feeding in. Yeah. Well, it definitely sounds like you're, like you're saying, voracious uh, reader and seeking inspiration and ideas from all corners, basically. It goes back to a very old uh, grammar school lesson you first start learning how to write. The teacher says, in order to write about a subject, you have to know about a subject. Yeah. Photography is absolutely no different. Hmm. The word photography means write with light. It sure does. Yeah. So if you're going to write, you have to know the subject. Um, and that, as far as I'm concerned, is essential 
no matter what genre you're in, you know the subject, then the story is is almost written for you. You just have to use the light to, to move the eye through the frame. Yeah. Well, yeah, no doubt about it. Very cool. Um... No, you're talking us talking to us before about your documentary project you've got underway, and obviously that's taking up a lot of your your time and your energy right now. I'm just curious, do you have uh, would you care to share one of your perhaps um, bucket list photography experiences or species that you'd love to get out and shoot someday that you haven't yet? Oh, I'm still after the bastard. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, I could. Uh, he, I saw the droppings just a couple of days ago outside the the window here at the house. Yeah. Uh, the white-tailed hare is a is a big jackrabbit. It lives here in the eastern Sierras. Yeah. And very secretive. Turns white in the winter time. It's a big guy. Uh, most people think it's a snowshoe hare, but it's it's a white-tailed hare. And um, when I get up in the morning, see, I, I I live three hours from the airport, so it's a three-hour drive to get a plane. And when I leave the house and start driving, especially in the wintertime, swear to Pete, at least <laughs> twice on my drive, it's along the side of the road waving at me as I go by. <laughs> um, I've spent many, many hours chasing him. I have two photographs. Both are butt shots of him running away. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so he's still my nemesis, um, and I, did, I affectionately call him the bastard. I would love to really get some shots of this very elusive um and some people think endangered critter uh, on film oh wow so what's the uh yeah what tell us more about that particular species then and it's it's endangered then is it uh like locally well, endangered or you know they actually go up from california the east side up through uh idaho and into montana where they're more common but it's like a number of species like our american um pikas Mm -hmm. where it's lost a habitat because it's getting warmer and warmer is giving it a, a smaller smaller shelf in which to to succeed and then it's had it's got other pressures here on the east side uh everything from domestic uh, grazing to habitat loss from construction so there's a number of things that have actually you know done a toll on it along with our sierra nevada red fox the wolverine a uh, number of critters that are you know you could say alpine species yeah. So it's just part of that group that um, nobody sees, no one really knows about, and um, even I can't give it any love because I can't get the bastard in my lens. <laughs> Very elusive then, eh? Hmm. Uh, I see his drops in the morning literally out my office window wow. um, and spend hundreds of hours on snowshoes uh, trying to, you know, find him out there and... Uh, even with my good friends, some, some biologists, we've done a number of things from trying to entice them in. No go. Wow. Wow. I, I know you've, uh, when I heard you speak in 2013 there too, you've uh, talked a lot about, you know, you have to have that patience and you've got to, you know, be willing to have a, a numb butt if you're going to sit out there and uh, you've got to be willing to strike out too. Do you have any uh, stories about the lengths you've gone to uh, to get a shot? Well, I, there isn't any critter that um, hasn't required an investment in time. That's a big part of it. Since I refuse to have an a impact on their daily activities, they have to do their thing and, and as, as if I am not there. And that, that takes time no matter what it is. Kid fox, um, marmots, pikas, you know, any of those things, for birds, they all require time, which is probably the one thing I – recommend and kind of you know number one tip i give any photographer no matter the genre hmm. is you have to give yourself time uh people are looking for results way too quickly uh be it photographic or financial or business it doesn't happen overnight it, it does take time so you know if you if it's a race between a snare and a turtle you've got to be the turtle <laughs> even though i'm constantly chasing that bastard yeah yeah wow let's see just um I'm thinking back to how you're again describing that those issues for that white-tailed hare there and some of the you know environmental or ecosystem issues that it's facing and I'm curious I know I've talked with a lot of other photographers about this but uh, I mean would you say something about that difference or where's that line between a wildlife photographer and a conservation photographer do you consider yourself primarily one or the other or does it matter I'm a wildlife photographer 
um, the um, being involved in um, the politics, something I was, you know, up to my eyeballs in for decades in many different ways, strictly on local and state reg- uh, state, you know, basis. Not so much anymore. Um, you know, you can only take so much of that stuff. And, and I would love to say that we have, you know, this, that and the other uh, victory. But we don't. Mm. Um, the victories are you count on one hand and they're short lived in, in many cases. So uh, the emotional toll to the being active, uh, you know, I guess you could say it's put me in the inactive roles. Not that my photography is inactive and putting my photographs in the hands of those who are still out there on the front lines, hmm. but I don't have my body or my mind on the front lines. Uh, the other thing also is that, uh, you know, life keeps going on and the, the biologists, the researchers, the mentors that I started with out 40 years ago, mm-hmm. um, most of those um, got all but one, I can think of, no, two, all but two I can think of are all retired. And at this point, many of them have, have passed along. You know, they're not here with us. Yeah. So I guess you could say that camaraderie of that uh, that gang mentality of, you know, we're going to sit there and, and conquer um, – isn't as strong anymore. That's just the kind of the way the world goes. So uh, my, my photographs do all that speaking for me. And uh, I've never was into black environmentalism. I've always have been on the positive side, whether it's, you know, wildlife or, or aviation or photography or gear. Um, there's plenty of negative crap out there. I don't, I don't want to hmm. be part of that. I'd rather be part of the positive. I mean, it's not that I'm ignoring the, the negative, but I don't put a light on it. Yeah. Well, I think you're definitely yeah, inspiring an appreciation for the uh, the species and yeah, even the planes that you shoot too, right? I think that, that definitely comes through loud and clear. Well, you know, without those um, those boys back then flying those planes, we wouldn't be here talking. I mean, <laughs> it's really that simple. Yeah. Uh, and it's kind of an oxymoron um, working with something that burns fossil fuel. Hmm. But, um, you know, the, the honoring of these, these, that generation, um, I don't think it can be, it can't be ignored. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's definitely, yeah, meaningful stuff for sure. Um, you talked about kind of the, your core comrades and everybody that was with you and uh, so many decades ago too, and that's kind of changed over the years. Uh, would you talk maybe a little bit about your your efforts with education in photography and perhaps how you're inspiring or giving the tools to um, generations as well, too, in the future? Well, I appreciate your saying that. I mean, it's, you know, the website's coming up on 4,000 pages of free information. So I don't have any secrets. If somebody wants to read, it's all there. And that's the biggest thing. You know, I... When I started out, I used to go to the research library at the Santa Barbara Museum of Natural History or the research library at UCSB. Yeah. This is back where you would talk to a librarian and they would help you find the right book. And then you would you'd have a big legal pad and a pencil and you'd you'd sit there and take notes or write down the pages and and all this stuff that was research, you know, and and uh, that's how it all got ingrained in you. So you went out shooting it was really much instilled in your, your being, what you're doing. Too many photographers now, um, and I hate generalizing because I know there's exceptions, but they don't even bother to read. Um, mm. And they look at a photograph and they make way too many assumptions from photographs when they have no idea, you know, what they are seeing or how they're seeing it or how it's constructed. Mm. And between that lack of knowledge and those assumptions, they're kind of putting themselves down a path where photographically, if you're in a business, you're not going to come back from it. Wow. So, wow. you know, my website's there to, you know, all the ills, all the rewards, all the successes and all the failures that, that are relevant are there. I mean, it's not uh, people assume a lot, um, but this is not a thing for fame and fortune. That's not what I and none of my peers I hang with are, are out to do or, or even seek. Mm-hmm. And if it comes, it's strictly by accident and it's going to be fleeting. It's never could be long lasting. So, you know, the education comes in many different ways. 
And uh, if I reach one person, I feel like I'm doing okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, again, uh, definitely no doubt about that as well, too, for sure. Um, I, I think earlier you talked about, and I'm, I'm sorry I didn't jot down the name, but you mentioned a uh, photographer and um, some writings about the, the natural world, too, that really inspired you. Um, to try to tie it into the, the educational piece there, I don't know, do you read any uh, photography books or do, would you have a, a book or a recent one that you'd recommend or that sparked, uh, sparked anything for you? I haven't read, which includes my own photography <laughs> book in eons. Okay? Uh, yeah. The books that I read uh, right now, uh, all everything, uh, everything I read this year is about our aircraft and uh, its role in World War II. Wow. And as I do research uh, for the documentary and for the interviews for the vets that I, I talk with. So everything I'm doing is very, uh, you know, I, we have no clue how many hundreds of hours go into the research to create a documentary. Um, you know, your basic movie, you go see a movie, you know, put down your two bucks, see a movie. Yeah. There's a script, there's storyboards, there's a, there's a whole plan to it. You know how you can get from A to Z and you know the ride you want to give the viewer. A documentary isn't that way because every day you go out, you're dealing with real life scenarios, good or bad, right? So you have to be fluid, you have to be able to deal with that and hmm. without, you could say, an end goal that you're always kind of bringing things back to, hmm. it's, 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 it's a challenge. I absolutely love that challenge. You know, I love the um, the whole process of, uh, you know, I, the plane we've got, you know, it flew over there, uh, built in 43, flew over there, flew in Operation Varsity, came back home. For 30 years, it sprayed mosquitoes in Florida. Wow. And it finished, it finished its job and it got parked and was done with, you know. Um, and now we're taking this, this plane back. And that's a lot of history and a lot of storytelling. So... It's a big responsibility, so I'm doing a lot of reading to get the story right. Well, yeah, that makes sense. I guess, yeah, you're definitely, uh, you do deep dives on your subjects, and this is where you're, the one you're on right now, for sure. And, you know, Critters, I did that for 30 years. So, yeah. bio, basic biology never changes. Yeah, That's yeah. why it's such a great thing to know. So, when it goes to Critters, it's it just falling off a, a bicycle and shooting for me. Yeah, yeah. Oh, very cool. Um, let's see here. I don't know if it's a, a cheesy one too, but I definitely had a question here too, that uh, when it comes time to hang up the cameras and the end of your career, what would you say is the impact that you hope you've had? Well, first, I don't see a day when that's going to happen. Yeah, I'd like to hear um, that. The cameras to the last moment. And I, you know, if I you know, send off to the world two, two sons that are very successful, I'll, be, I'll feel great. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Definitely uh, enjoy photography. And it's kind of funny, too. I would have conversations with folks at the bank or whatever, or you're planning for retirement. It's like, well, I'm going to be doing the, doing this until I can't do it anymore. So, uh, yeah, I don't don't think there's a date there or anything like that. So, nope. as long as I can keep doing, I will. Yep. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Well, that's great to hear for sure. Um, Let's see. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's kind of about it for what I was hoping to chat about. But um, Excellent. Yeah, that's awesome. Really appreciate your time there, Moose. And uh, I can't My wait. My pleasure. To, can't wait to hear more about your uh, documentary when it comes out there. I was... Uh... Uh, yes, that's where the recording conked out. It's uh, kind of embarrassing, but I was using this bit of software called Camtasia to record our screencast um the skype call with moose there and believe it or not that was um just by the skin of our teeth we got that interview recorded right and didn't realize basically how large camtasia's files were for you know a longer recording and it you know took up multiple gigabytes we're talking you know 20 plus gigabytes for basically 30 minutes of recording time so that was not what i was expecting I uh, thought I had enough headroom on the drive that I was using there for that one. I promise that will happen in the future. But as you can see, we made it to the end. We were just saying our goodbyes there. So that's all you're missing out on. Promise. 
and we're definitely going to get that solved. We're not going to have that problem again in the future with our future calls. So definitely thanks Moose for being such a great sport with this first conversation in the uh, series over at shuttermuse.com. Really appreciate it and uh, just love the insight you're able to provide and the stories you're able to share with us. And uh, for everyone tuning in, really hope you enjoyed that too. And thank you for your patience with some of the uh, you know technical difficulties and hiccups and everything along the way. Uh, really happy to have this opportunity to share, um, to let you look over my shoulder as I'm learning and reaching out to these folks too and uh, hoping to gain from their experience as I'm really just beginning my full-time uh, career in photography here in Saskatchewan too and really going to try to leverage these conversations to gain some great insights into how folks have uh, built their business, how they've um, maintained that passion for photography and uh, just what keeps them clicking out in the field. So I can't give any names away right now, but uh, we've got a great lineup of folks that we're going to be getting recorded and getting those sessions written up for you on shuttermuse.com too in the coming months. And promise you're going to want to stay tuned there. It's not all wildlife photographers. We've got a whole bunch of different genres um, accounted for there and really looking forward to diving in with this new year and this new series. Uh, so definitely stay tuned. We'll keep you posted and we'll see you for the next one. Have a good one.